Okay, welcome to lecture 36. So, today we will start abstracts and uh, well, it is not a very common name uh, for what might be called an application of the principle of abstraction, which again is not a very common principle. Okay. Uh, essentially, according to Tennant, for example, in his book, he defines the principle of abstraction as just any semantically meaningful syntactic category can be used as the body of an abstract, right. And actually, what what we mean by an abstract, we have actually done some abstraction in a certain way and that is the declarations in the ML let construct. So, essentially the whole point about abstraction is this uh, and we should, uh, let us not confuse this word abstraction with abstraction in the lambda calculus, though they are somewhat related. So, when we talk about abstraction, we are really saying that there is some complicated uh, object or a group of objects and in general I am talking about any objects, it does not necessarily mean code, okay. it does not necessarily mean data or code, uh, any objects in fact uh, for which which we would like to group together either for some logical reason because they belong together or we would like to uh, group them together for some convenience. So, one form of abstraction is for example, uh, your uh, the fact that I mean a department within an institute is a form of abstraction. Okay, you, there, there is a there is a group of people, equipment, furniture, rooms, whatever, which somehow are grouped together and regarded as one consistent whole. I mean, so records, for example, in in programming languages also form some part of an abstraction. But the notion of an abstraction can be generalized to essentially not just data, but any logical grouping of objects and I, I do not necessarily refer to objects in, um, in the sense of uh, programming objects. I am saying that we use this principle essentially uh, throughout our lives in, a, in almost every, in, a, in every field of activity, right. So, one natural abstraction is is that is the are the declarations in a let construct in ml right so there is an the the main the main body of a let construct is the expression which is finally evaluated but there is enough reason to take sub expressions from that expression abstract them out by giving them a new name which is what you do in a declaration and use that name wherever that sub expression is intended. Okay. So, that is a form of abstraction. You have some complicated expression, you split it up into sub expressions which for various reasons either for purely logical reasons or because you want to frequently use that sub expression for various reasons which might be determined by a programmer, he removes that sub expression, may puts a declaration and gives that sub expression a name and uses that name wherever that is sub expression is intended, right. So, essentially what the programmer has done there is that he has performed an abstraction in the sense that 
as far as the main expression in a let construct is concerned, he does not really, he would like it to somehow stand on its own and so you have some declarations like this, let x equals I do not know some complicated expression okay, in some expression maybe uh, okay. So, essentially what, what has been done is that this expression 3 star y plus z should have should have occurred here wherever x occurs and for some reason best known to the programmer he has deemed it uh, not exactly necessary, but helpful at least convenient at least to abstract out that sub expression, give it a name and use that name throughout. Okay. So, essentially what, what the structure, what this abstraction gives us is that it gives us this expression, the main body of this expression where if we if we choose we do not really require to look deeply into what x is. Okay. It provides a form of hiding which, uh, which you need to look into only if you really want to. Okay. So, that is what an abstraction does. An abstraction takes some complicated object or group of objects and somehow performs a certain hiding on them, so that the, so that what might be perceived as irrelevant or unnecessary detail can be hidden or can be eliminated or can be skipped and only the main overview of that group of objects can be viewed. Okay. And this abstraction is something that that is actually that is actually very common throughout our lives. I mean, uh, uh, if you if you look at all your all your pieces of equipment, essentially what you are saying is that there is an internal. You've got a black box view, and that black box view itself is a form of abstraction. You've got an interface, which is all that is visible to you. The internal details are hidden. The internal mechanisms are hidden, and all that you are interested in is the interface. So, you do not need to open the black box if you do not want to know the internal details. Okay. So, the internal details are hidden, so that a form of hiding that we have already seen is uh, that of scope rules, but that is a very rigid form of hiding in the sense that it is if, if you are inside the scope, you can see whatever is there in the scope. If you are outside the scope, you really cannot see anything. Okay. So, but that so that is a form of abstraction. The scoping is also a form of abstraction, but what we are looking at more now is what might be called named abstractions. We have looked at abstractions in their unnamed forms, either um, as unnamed blocks or uh, lambda expressions, but what we are looking for now are named blocks. Okay, so uh, uh, named abstractions and naming, despite what despite what uh, anybody might say, is actually very important. Despite what Shakespeare might say, it is actually very important. If the flower rose did not have an, uh, a name, Shakespeare would not have been able to give his famous quote about it and he would have been puzzled what to do about it. Right? So, naming is actually an important aspect of all forms of abstraction. Right? So, the major syntactic categories which are for us semantically meaningful throughout, I mean a unified view of programming languages would say that there are really only three syntactic categories. Expression, expressions, commands and declarations and all of them have abstractions available to them. You can create abstractions with all of them 
and uh, what we will primarily concern ourselves now with are what might be called uh, the command abstracts. So, which are really procedures in imperative languages, right. So, this we have already looked at expression abstracts though I did not explicitly mention that they are abstracts. We will we'll look now at procedures, procedural abstracts uh, which is not exactly the same as the notion of procedural abstraction which, uh, which Abelson and Sussman give in their book uh, on scheme, but it is similar and related. So, we are looking at abstraction in imperative languages and then there are abstractions possible uh, over declarations or declarations are definitions and they are the abstractions which are called modules or classes. Okay, modules are just names of name uh, a named collection of declarations grouped together for some reason, right. A uh, class is well a module parameterized to include various uh, subtyping and inheritance properties and so on. So, it is it is really, so these these are, uh, so, th the, so these are the declaration abstracts that uh, uh, we will, we will not necessarily look at in great detail, but let us look at procedural abstracts. So, uh, so as I said one thing that is important about so, the most important features of an abstract are firstly it is naming. Okay. So, the fact that you give a name to an abstract means firstly that even if that name is inappropriate, incongruous or plain ridiculous, it still stands for some collection of properties or objects which it names. And naming therefore, allows a repeated use of the same kind of objects in an abbreviated form. A naming actually provides an abbreviation which can be used repeatedly, right. So, our use of names in um, uh, even, even, even in uh, uh, natural language or our use of pronouns are really forms of uh, local declarations uh, so that you give it and give, uh, give something the name it and you can use the word it repeatedly for that something and that something could be some complicated. Uh, object which may not be capable of being described uh, very conveniently and it yet forms a logical hold, right. So, you, so the use of words like uh, he, it, she and so on in our natural language is really a form of local declaration and very often let me tell you most people use them ambiguously, but uh, if they are not used ambiguously they actually form a local declaration to allow for repeated use. So, pronouns are really names for abstracts even in natural language, right. So, naming is an important thing which in the sense that it allows a repeated use of the same well in the case of programming languages same computations at several different control points in the program, right. The thing with unnamed blocks is and that is that is in fact true of this expression abstract too. There are at least two occurrences of this x and if I did not if this x were something really complicated then I would have to replace this x by that complicated expression. So, it is important to have naming so that you uh, you allow a rip, uh, you allow an abbreviated name uh, an abbreviated abstract name which can be used repeatedly in different contexts okay so which essentially for the same kind of computations that you want be want to be performed at different contexts by the use of a name you can 
abbreviate that. But then the moment you the semantically speaking the moment you introduce a name you are also it also means you have to introduce a binding. And pragmatically speaking the moment you introduce a name you have to generate some code which actually interprets that name in something that is that is consistent with the semantical use. Right? So, both semantically and pragmatically names create fresh bindings and we have to we have to do something about those fresh bindings. Okay? And but they provide this convenience to the <coughs> user of repeated use of performing of of actually standing for some complicated object or a group of objects and so can be referenced by a single name. And further if you parameterize the names then instead of just being able to duplicate the same computations by using the name you can duplicate many similar computations by varying the parameters. Right? So, a name and a collection of parameters allows you to actually perform this abstraction so that the parameters form what you might call the interface to the black box, what is actually externally available for viewing without looking inside the black box. Right? So, the the name and the parameters together what they can do is they can actually provide an when you when you look at many similar computations to be parameterized you are performing another form of abstraction where you are emphasizing the similarities of the computations and de-emphasizing or hiding the differences in the in those computations. Right? So, abstraction as a form of hiding essentially with, with parameters means precisely that. You are trying to emphasize or highlight the similarity of different uses of that name rather than emphasize the dissimilarities or the differences between the various uses in the various contexts. Okay? So, despite <coughs> everything uh, in especially uh, the issue of naming has cropped up recently also in the whole question of uh, mobile computations uh, with, with cellular phones, car phones, the specification of such things. And it turns out that naming turns out is one of well both philosophically, linguistically and, uh, and computationally one of the most important objects which we have overlooked or treated quite shabbily in the last uh, 40 years of programming languages. Yeah, right. So, so, so the main features of an abstract therefore are its name, parameters and of course what it, what is actually what it actually represents and that is its body. Right. So, uh, and the body of an abstract of course as I said uh, since abstracts uh, can be uh, you can have expression abstracts that means this expressions can be evaluated. You can have command abstracts which means those commands can be executed. You can have declaration abstracts which means those declarations can be elaborated. Right? And so, uh, so, the, so the, the three features of an abstract are really this the issue of naming, <coughs> the issue of parameters and the body. And we will not worry really too much about the body because we have already done unnamed blocks and abstractions. We know how those bodies are executed or elaborated or evaluated. Okay? Now, it is just a question of looking at naming and parameterizing. Okay? If you look at parameterizing, then the question of parameterizing again boils down to substitutions in a calling environment. 
right. It is a matter of performing certain appropriate substitutions in a calling environment. The issue of naming is also a question of performing a substitution in an appropriate environment. Eventually all forms of computation are really forms of substitution in appropriate environments, appropriate substitutions in appropriate environments. Okay. So, so that is one of the reasons why we had to do the lambda calculus in some detail so that you appreciate that everything really has to do with substitution. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we have this, uh, so these are the features of an abstract and uh, uh, we will concentrate on naming, ma mainly in, uh, on naming and control abstraction for, uh, uh, for some time now. Okay, so, let us look at control abstraction. Most programming languages are what might be called command, uh, command abstraction, right. So, uh, command abstraction in most programming languages, most imperative programming languages is really in the form of, uh, in the form of procedures, okay. And uh, though again, uh, so, so, and what are these procedures? They are really uh, an encapsulation of commands, of a, of a command or a group of commands and uh, by encapsulation I mean essentially gift wrapping it, so that you do not see the internal details. <coughs> you might name them and parameterize them, right. So, of course, you can have uh, naming of course, is compulsory. Uh, in many languages, but parameterization is optional, right. Um, in languages like Algol 60, even naming is not compulsory and that is how you get unnamed blocks. In Algol 60 C, you can use unnamed blocks where naming is not compulsory. And essentially what happens in such languages is that naming is used only when there are repeated uses in different contexts. If there is going to be only a single use, but it is still an abstract, you just define an unnamed block, right. Um, so, so it is, so encapsulation of commands is really what command abstraction is all about. And uh, most programming languages, okay, this is, this, this is some terminology which I have taken from tenant. It is not necessarily standard, it is not necessarily widely used, but it actually captures the essential meaning that you have expression procedures, okay, which means which basically corresponds to functions in Pascal. Functions is a greatly abused word, so it is a good idea to use the term expression procedures. They are procedures because they transform state because they are commands, their bodies are commands, so they are a command abstraction. Okay. They are expression procedures because they return values of expressions too. Okay. They are procedures because they are a command abstraction and therefore they, are, they change state or change configuration, but we prefix them with the word expressions because they also return values. And then you just have what might be called command procedures, which are the normal procedures in Pascal. Right. Uh, so, so basically, entities in Pascal with the reserved word function are expression procedures. Entities in Pascal with the reserved word procedure are command procedures. Yeah, and procedures in general, the way we'll be using the word is to denote any form of command abstraction which is named, which has a name which has a name is important because it means it, it also has bindings. There are bindings to their name and you have to decide what exactly is being bound to that name. <coughs> okay. What is the type of object that a command procedure is? What kind of a, what kind of a creature is it? I mean that is, that is an important question and the name should denote that. The, should classify the kind of beast uh, that this command abstraction is, right? Right. So, 
So what we'll do is let's play around with a, with a few permutations. So this issue of naming. So let's let's look at an abused Pascal-like syntax, and I'll tell you the reason for the abuse. So you have let's let's look at a Pascal-like procedure. For the moment, I will forget about the parameters. They're optional. So a typical procedure structure is reserved word procedure, some a name, a procedure identifier, parameters may be semicolon, some local declarations, begin, a command, end, right. So now, what, what, have, we, what have we done by this naming is that we are claiming that this is the name of a semantical object which represents this command abstraction, right. So the abstraction, uh, the, the syntax for performing that command abstraction is the reserved word procedure, okay. So, uh, so essentially what we are saying is let P be the abstraction procedure parameters, local declarations begin C end, rather let P be the name of this particular abstraction with these parameters, yeah. Similarly for functions, um, you have this syntax and what we are essentially saying is let F be the expression procedure defined by function parameters colon some type semicolon local declarations command maybe and uh, I have for convenience I have just written result e okay and the reason for that is as follows the way pascal works is that it uses the function name itself as a variable local to the function so, instead of this what you would have is f is assigned e, right. But then that f has a that, so but then there are two f's in the same scope. One f is a, is an, is, is this beast which we still do not know what, a, what it is, it is an abstract. The other f is a local variable which has, which just has this type specified here. right there are other there are other problems with it i mean uh, with in a language in which you have side effects um, global variables uh, can be uh, can be used can be modified within the function and so on and so forth and in a language which does not allow more than uh, more than a simple um, type to be returned as function values supposing i want a huge collection of values to be returned, a record to be returned <coughs> or even a file to be returned after the evaluation of a function, what do I do? Well, one possibility is to, uh, to actually return a pointer to that object which is what for example most C programmers do, they return pointers to structures, okay which you can do in Pascal too. Other possibility is to actually treat this, if it is some complicated type to treat it as a global and perform the side effects and make it a parameterless function, uh, make it a parameterless procedure or uh, in case there are problems about whether it is it was successfully executed or not, just return a boolean value, but the actual uh, side effects that you are interested, the actual effects that you are interested or the values that you are interested are, are stored through side effects on globals, for example, on files, yeah. So now supposing there were no parameters, supposing it is a parameterless function and I had f is assigned some expression involving f itself, okay. Then there is a resulting ambiguity is that f 
a recursive call to this function f or is it does, it does it refer to the local variable f which was created as part of the elaboration of this function right. So, supposing I had this statement if I followed rigid Pascal syntax I had this statement like this for a function f which is parameterless. Okay. Then the use of the same function name as a local variable I still do not know what the type of an abstract is, but what I do know is that the type of this regarded as a local variable is whatever is the type specified here. Okay. The use of this therefore and this uh, since this, this type is involved inside here it is not it is not at all clear that this function f itself has the abstract the abstract the expression abstract f has the same type as this local variable f right I mean why should it it may not in which case does this f refer to the local variable f or does it refer to a recursive call to the function f itself okay that is an ambiguity that has not really been addressed many implementations take their own view uh, uh, they they actually for example turbo pascal actually refer, uh, refuses to recognize a recursive parameterless function it assumes automatically that if f occurs if the name of the function occurs on the right hand side of an assignment then uh, that f must be the local variable f which is created as part of the function right. So, that is one reason why it is perhaps not a very good idea to oh, of course there are, there are very simple syntactic ways of uh, changing I mean of, uh, of rectifying this ambiguity and that is uh, to insist that all functions whether they have parameters or not have a pair of braces around them in the declaration and if you are using it as a local variable just call it just use f if you are actually making a recursive call make it this way I mean there are simple uh, uh, patches of doing uh, of, of uh, changing this but that is not the point the point is that what you are interested in firstly is that this object which has been called f whose type I still do not know all I know is that it is an it is a command abstract whose most important things are the creation of some side effects because it uses commands changing state and finally, re finally returning a value of the type specified here right that is really what this object is yeah and so the issue of naming therefore, so essentially we look at so the intuitive meaning of uh, what might be called procedures are that so I will uh, I am this p and f are with reference to the, the previous ex, uh, example let us say. So, so essentially the intuitive meaning of a procedure in an imperative language is that a procedure p is a function which well will take which take which might take some parameters and a store and gives me a fresh store. Right, and an expression procedure or a Pascal function is is a mapping which might take some parameters and a store, give me a value which is actually specified by the body E of the expression procedure, and give me a change store which is actually defined by the command C. And since the language allows for side effects even in expression evaluation what this E itself could change the store the evaluation of this E itself could change the store right. 
So, basically what, what we are saying is, uh, so therefore uh, an expression procedure or a Pascal like function is just, is just something that uh, takes parameters of appropriate types and the current and the current store and returns a value and a new store. And a procedure is something that takes appropriate parameters and a current store and returns a new store. And the abstraction that you are interested in, what does, what intuitively does the abstraction mean under such a semantic setting? It means that if you are, let us, let us just consider this, uh, let us just consider procedures. It means that this, the change from one store, let us say sigma 1 to our final store sigma 2 actually goes through a sequence of changes whose intermediate changes you are not interested in, you are hiding them, right. You are only interested in what is the final store that is reached given this initial store. If you did not have a named procedure, then what you would have had to do is you would have had to take that body C and place it in line in your code, in which case in your main code, in which case you would have, you would, you, it means that you are essentially interested in every state that is produced by that body C. And the semantic abstraction that you provide by this is that you hide all the intermediate states while going from the initial state to the final state, right. So, that is what, uh, so we will essentially look at it that way, uh, we will we'll postpone the semantics for a bit. Uh, Let us look at uh, some other issues uh, since we are talking about naming and identifiers. So, we have to look at the issue of scope again. Uh, so, the normal scope rules that we are all used to as what are known as the static scoping rules. So, which means that given uh, what in programming is called a non-local identifier in a procedure or what to, to be consistent with whatever we have done, it is actually a free identifier of a procedure. So, the free identifiers of a procedure are just those which are neither parameters nor have been locally declared. So, every identifier that is that is neither locally declared nor which has a nor which is a parameter which by the way are also declared is a free identifier or what might be called a non-local identifier and it is statically bound in the environment, right. So, which means that the binding occurrences for such non-local references are determined statically that means they are determined at compile time before any before any thought of execution of the program occurs and the binding occurrences are determined by by the innermost enclosing scope rule okay so given any reference to an identifier by and now this identifier also includes procedure identifiers, function identifiers, what have you. Anything which has a name, it actually for anything that has a name, it refers to the innermost lexically enclosing scope in which that name has been declared. And that is something that is compile time determinable. So, this is, this is, this is known as static scoping or lexical scoping. <coughs> and the binding that is created by that is well it is naturally called static binding. So, this is the binding that is created by the compiler as it reads through your code, right. And most languages including, including scheme important, including scheme actually use static scoping rules. And uh, as opposed to static scoping, what you have is what you, the other possibility is what is known as dynamic scoping. 
right. So, uh, now what happens in, uh, in the case of a dynamic scope? Uh, if you have dynamic scoping rules, what it means is any non local reference, for any non local reference, the appropriate binding occurrence cannot really be determined at compile time. Okay? And the dynamic means that whatever you do has to be, can only be, more, um, is most likely possible only at runtime. So, which means that you actually, so whatever are the free or non-local identifiers in the abstract, they are bound not statically, but they are bound in the environment, in the calling environment, what might we call the calling environment, right. So, this is, so these are, so for so, so what it means is that at different points in the program, if there are different calls, then different, at different calls the same identifier might refer to different things. The, the binding occurrences cannot be determined by looking at the text of the program. The binding occurrences can only be determined by looking at the runtime stack at that point, right. So, and this is what is used in Lisp and APL and, and what it, and it, what it falls, uh, what it follows is really the innermost enclosing call rule rather than the innermost enclosing block rule, okay. A block is a piece of text, a call is a runtime object. Okay. There is a nest, there is a nesting of calls and the innermost enclosing call which actually contains a declaration for that object is the reference to that object, is the, is the binding occurrence that you are looking for. Yeah. So, let us, let us just look at this, uh, uh, let us just look at these differences uh, somewhat more pictorially. So, let us, so what I will do is as usual to me all languages are either either have ML syntax or they have Pascal syntax. So, uh, but right now we do not even need to worry too much about syntax. We just have to worry about uh, boundaries and so on and so forth, scope boundaries and so on. So, assume there is a program P, okay, which has uh, a declaration of, of x. So, when I write x colon dot dot dot, it means that this is a declaration for x. Okay. Uh, and then within the program P, there is uh, a procedure let us say P 1 okay? and uh, there is a, a within pr a procedure P 1 there is a procedure P 1 1 okay? and this is what I might call the static structure of the program. I mean the program as you read it on a printout, no machine anywhere, just read the printout. If you read the printout and look at sort of uh, block boundaries, I would not say scope boundaries, let us look at block boundaries. Then the program P is this entire uh, Barney purple object uh, and uh, the procedure P 1 is this red object lexically nested inside the program P. The procedure P 1 1 is this blue object, dark blue object lexically nested textually nested within the procedure P 1. And uh, after P 1, there is another procedure P 2. Okay. So, you can assume that P 2 follows P 1 if you like, uh, I did not have enough space. Uh, so, P 2 and within P 2, well there is a black procedure P 2 1. P 2 contains a declaration for x. Right. So, now the point is this, if this were a Pascal program and there is a reference to x inside this P 1 1, what is the binding occurrence for that reference to x? And that binding occurrence follows normal textual rules. So, you take the innermost 
textually enclosing block which contains a declaration for x and therefore this x refers to this x. I am assuming that P1 does not have any declaration of x. Yeah. So then the innermost enclosing block which contains a declaration of x is this purple x. So therefore this, this blue x is actually this purple x. So all references to x within this blue procedure are really references to this purple x. Right? Assuming of course that neither P1 nor P11 has a local declaration of x. Okay? However, if this were not a Pascal program but in a, a Lisp or an APL program, then it is not clear what this x refers to. You cannot make out from the text of the program that this x refers to either this or this. What this x refers to really depends upon the execution time behavior. So let us look at an execution time behavior. Let us assume that this is, a, this is the body of the main program P and there is a call to procedure P2. Okay? So which means you have this green x here, uh, you are executing the body of procedure P2 and within it there is a call to procedure P1. So which means you go through this and within P1 there is a call to procedure P11 and you find this reference to x and now the question is what does this x represent? What is the binding occurrence of this x? Okay. There is an x in the, in the global environment because you called it from the global environment. There is an x also in an enclosing calling environment namely in P2. Now the now which x does this refer to? If you use the innermost call rule, then the closest declaration of x in the calling environment is this green x and therefore this x refers to this p2. Okay. So the, and the reason I am saying it is important to realize that it is part of the calling environment is that Sometime later in the main program, if I had actually called P1, okay, then the calling chain, assuming that it is a similar calling chain, then P1 is called, P1 calls P11 and again this you refer and this, the same reference to X now in the calling environment is of this purple X. So at different points, depending on what the calling environment is, the binding occurrences can change. So, which means that at compile time, you cannot make any commitments about the reference to this x. You do not know at all at compile time. At compile time, what does it mean? You would have read the declarations of p, you would have read the declarations of p1, you would have read the declarations of p11, you will be processing the body of p11 and you encounter x. And you cannot jump to the conclusion that since you have this x here, it, it refers to this x. Because at, at the point when you read this, you have no notion what are the calls and what is the sequence of calls that are actually going to be performed at run time. When you come down to the calls, even if you chase the sequence of calls, you have by that time this has become a black box which is not available to you. The information in P11 is no longer available to the compiler when you are processing the body of the program P. Okay. So which means that at compile time, no, in, a, in a dynamic scoping environment, at compile time no commitments can be made about non-local references. Right? And if no commitments can be made, that means that the very act of compiling itself is actually a useless activity. You cannot create any bindings, you cannot do any memory allocation because you do not know what x is. You do not know what x it refers to, you cannot do any, so you cannot do type checking, you cannot do uh, memory allocation, 
you can't do any storage representation. So, all of them will have to be deferred, postponed till you start executing the program, which means you might as well dispense with the compiler and just interpret the program directly and that is why most Lisp and APL systems are interpreters. They do have compiling features these days, I mean, but the original Lisp and APL systems were purely interpretive uh, programming systems, yeah, which and what and the reason for using dynamic scoping rules there or more was more pragmatic than planned, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, let us let us quickly look at this. So, uh, this this call that I looked at uh, actually has this uh, there is a starting uh, there might be an initial environment consisting of globals, libraries and so on which might be loaded. Then there is this call from P to P2, P2 to P1, P1 to P11 and there is a reference to X. And if you work backwards along the chain, the innermost call rule tells you that this x under a dynamic scoping uh, under dynamic scoping rules refers to this green x. Whereas, if you maintain somehow this the static nesting structure of the program even in the calling environment, then what you get is that this x if you you will have to go backwards along this static nesting chain and you will never hit this green x, you will only hit this purple x and so under static scoping rules you have to uh, I mean it 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 will give it should give you this uh, uh, the purple x for the same sequence of calls yeah. So, and uh, so what it means is that actually what this means is that uh, static scoping though it is textually very nice and allows for debugging, allows for compiling, allows for compile time type checking, allows for compile time code generation and so on and so forth. What it means is that there is an overhead associated with it. That overhead is that you have to maintain the static structure of the program, you have to capture the static structure of the program, the textual structure the lexical scoping structure of the program somehow in your runtime environment so that your references are statically determined. On the other hand, a dynamic scoping does not require this extra overhead of maintaining that information. You just traverse down the runtime stack and find the take the first x that you can see period and your dynamic scoping rules are implemented. So, dynamic scoping it is not convenient for the purpose of reading a program or debugging it from a listing, but it is it is a simple environment. I mean at that at that point you take a decision to go down the stack and find the first x that you encounter and that is the x that you are referring to. Whereas, in a static scope what it means is that you have to maintain this information. After all uh, static scoping is not preserved really in the runtime structure because because as you can see I mean there is a call from P2 to P1 and P2 to P1 are at the same level, at the same nesting level and they are independent right. So, which uh, which which means that your runtime stack does not necessarily maintain all this information, textual information right. So, so uh, and how do how do this uh, so, so a typical uh, static environment at so at compile time what you have for the same program is that at the time at the time when you refer when you when you reach the blue x you actually have a, a static environment which includes type environments and so on nesting depths and so on and so forth with all this information in the symbol table not necessarily in this fashion because symbol tables for fast they since their references uh, are very frequent symbol tables are usually organized as through as hash tables I mean, through hashing. But the logical structure of the symbol table if you assumed a linear search for references would be that you have this kind of a stack with well the you have to res, uh, look at NY I mean you might there is a global environment. 
uh, of reserved words, keywords, environment variables, library identifiers, types and so on and so forth. Then your main program, the symbol table for your main program with type information, storage information and so on and so forth. Then as you go through, you come to the declaration of P1. So, you have the symbol table for the local declarations of P1, the parameters of P1 and so on and so forth and you keep incrementing the nesting depth at each point and maintaining that nesting depth. Then you, you will reach P11, you would, not, you would not have touched P2 yet, okay. So there is no question of looking at the green reference to X, at the green declaration of X. So and so therefore what you will look at in the static environment is you will just go down this well, logical stack because it is not really organized that way and find the first X and that gives you the innermost enclosing block which contains the binding occurrence. And if you maintain these nesting depths, then the reference to any x is just uh, the position, uh, the, the reference to any x is just how many, how many uh, nesting depths down you have to go followed by whatever relative address has been assigned to that x, right. And that is the reference to x. So, you can you can substitute all, ref, non, non, all references to x by this ordered pair of nesting depth and relative address, except that this nesting depth has to be maintained in the runtime environment somehow. And for that, we have what is known as a static chain pointer, okay. We will continue next. <coughs>